You know, it's uh, in the Old Testament, there's a line. If the foundations are destroyed, are destroyed, what will the righteous do? And, you know, in Old Testament, respected by almost all Abrahamic religions, you know, crosses lines of Islam and Christianity and Judaism. And it, it's a mysterious text because mixed in it, you get answers to things. And so if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then the answer comes later in the same text, Psalms. And, uh, and it goes, uh, the stone that was refused shall become the headstone of the corner, right? And so if, if the foundations are destroyed, right, and you break things apart, then somebody's going to pick that up and build something. And we have been beaten down and pushed around and harmed and defeated many times. It hasn't always been good. But at some of the darkest and most difficult points in that history, there are a handful of people who say, well, that's when we start something. So after George W. Bush stole the presidency, he was not elected president. He lost, the, he lost by 540,000 votes. By any, any democracy in the world, George Bush wouldn't have been president. Ed Garvey started Bombfest. He didn't start it when things were going great. He started after he got beat for governor. That merely for Ed, getting beaten in the election was nothing all that <laughs> shocking. Um, <laughs> but he got beat for governor, and then he had the presidency stolen away from him, right? I mean, I mean the whole thing was a disaster. He says, well, let's have a party. <laughs> and, and when I think about who is in that tradition, who has done that well, I have to think of our friend Nate Tip. Because yeah. <laughs> if you look at this, at this annual gathering, man, its roots are not in the good times. <laughs> its, roots are, its roots go back to times where we were getting beat and having bad things happen, as is frequent. Um, and this wonderful gathering, which is the single best gathering in the state of Wisconsin for grassroots core progressive politics rooted in the rural parts of this state. Woo. Doesn't mean you're all rural, I know that. But rooted in the rural parts of this state because progressivism is not an urban tradition, it is a rural tradition. Yes, yes, it yes, came yes, off yes. farms and out of small towns, and this, this annual gathering keeps that alive, brings us in from all sorts of places, and reminds us of what we're fighting for and what we're about. And one of the most important things that the best of our rural tradition is about is our sense of solidarity, our sense of connection with people who we know and also with people who we don't know that well. Because the fact of the matter is if you live in a rural place, right, there's a hell of a lot of people you don't know, like everybody in the world. Because <laughs> you're out there in the middle of nowhere farming or doing whatever you're doing at 5 a.m. And, and yet, a good rural progressive has a sense of solidarity and connection to the rest of their state, their nation, and their world. It's what makes us so special. And we get beaten down. I'll talk a little about that in a moment. But today, I brought a friend of mine along. Because I think it's really important that she get to know us a little better. And that we get to know her a little better. And sadly, we gather not, not you know, in a, in a moment of joy, because as we said, we, don't, we never do anything when things are right, right? <laughs> we never ever start something when things are going good. And my friend Nada, who is the chair of the Next Gen Group on the UW campus, and has also, uh, she's a, a, as we understand, is a, um, a super senior about to finish at UW. And as you might have guessed, Nada is a Mennonite. No. <laughs> I was wondering. Well, I was going to help your rural folks, because, you know, we do have Mennonites in Wisconsin, and women will cover, you know, and so I thought maybe you know, the tradition. Nada's Muslim. And one of the reasons why, why I thought it was really important that she join us today is that just a week ago, we saw one of the most horrific events in the history of the world, an event that shook Islam globally, but that also shook 
any person of good faith and good character. And so I hope you'll please welcome my friend Nada to say a few words and to ground us as we continue our conversation. Please, Nada, join us. I don't know how I can follow up the raging grannies, but I'll try. Um, my name is Nada, and I'm a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, studying genetics and legal studies, and I'm chair of the school's chapter of Next Gen America. Two Fridays ago, the world woke to harrowing news. Fifty prayer growers were shot to death at the Friday ceremony in Christchurch, New Zealand. That morning, I scrolled through my Twitter feed for hours, praying. <coughs> As a Muslim American, my blood ran cold. I didn't know what I was looking for, but putting faces and names to the victims seemed to be the only way to mediate the extraordinary amount of pain I felt. I couldn't let myself forget them, and quitting the app felt like I was doing that. It felt like I was doing my Muslim brothers and sisters halfway across the world a disservice. I needed to hear their stories. I needed to be convinced that in the face of so much evil, good still existed. Sadly, this is not the first time I had gone through that. Christ Church was no different than the Tree of Life synagogue shooting months before, or Orlando, or Charlottesville. It seemed like I was in a constant state of mourning, as hate continued to take the lives of those who least deserved it. Repeated trauma tends to encourage desensitization. What I feared was not forgetting them myself, but rather the normalization of the hatred that killed them. Senseless violence, when not addressed appropriately, becomes a societal norm. We accept it as an inevitability of the human condition, and in doing so, we fail to proportionally chastise those who impose it <coughs> and those who benefit from it. When it happens somewhere else, it's not our problem. When it hits closer to home, it becomes our problem, but only for a little while. Pain is a heavy burden to bear, and I understand that our automatic reaction is to store it away where it can't hurt us. But this pain, the pain we feel when others are killed for doing no more than worshipping differently, that is the pain we need to hold on to, because it is what stops it from happening again. The American attention span is notoriously short term. I'm well aware of that. So I don't expect us to dwell on tragedy forever, nor what I want us to. However, this pain is progress. It reminds us of our shared humanity, and it reminds us that there is much more that holds us together and sets us apart. I am a black Muslim immigrant woman. I am what this administration and those like it fear, and I am the tool they use to undermine our values of unity and compassion. But as much as I and others like me have suffered in the hands of their dangerous politics, I can't encourage more division. America is still good. We are still much better defined in our love for one another than we were ever defined by those who want to split us apart. The voices of hate are not the majority. They are just the loudest. We have to be louder than those who have tried to convince us otherwise. And the single most effective way we can do that is by participating in our democracy. I am from a little village in Sudan, Africa. I immigrated to the US when my father won the diversity visa lottery in the 90s. People in the world I come from do not have the right to march or protest. Politics in Africa and elsewhere are a dangerous realm of oppression and suppression. Voting is reduced to a corrupt, rigged, and unfair political process that hides behind the facade of democracy. So it confuses me why we as Americans take ours for granted. It confuses me why we have such low voter turnout rates across the country. There are people that die every day on the ballot field of the ballot box. There are people who have willingly spilled their blood so that we could be represented in our government. Who are we to throw that away? We have a responsibility to make this world a better place for everyone else. We can stop tragedies like Christ Church from happening again by voting for officials who admonish Nazis, implement sensible gun reform, and show the bare minimum of empathy and human emotion. It only takes an hour of our afternoon on election day to show the world that we are not part of their divisive rhetoric of men like Trump or otherwise, nor will we let their violence be carried out in our name. Much like my religion, the America I know is loving, it is kind, and it is forgiving. So let's show that. That is what we owe the victims of last Friday's attack. That is what we owe our country. 
And that is what we owe ourselves. Thank you. Makes us a better country. Wasn't her immigration story such a special thing, like all of our immigration stories? And isn't it wonderful that we have a chance to gather here in this room and celebrate Islam, celebrate a religion like Christianity, like Judaism, that came to this country? and that rooted in rural America. Now, do you know where the first mosque in the United States was built, the first freestanding mosque? Nobody ever does. That's OK. No one has ever known. It, is, it was, in fact, in rural North Dakota, in a town of 62 people. The first freestanding mosque in the United States built in North Dakota. They had come out of the Bekaw Valley, and they got to Ellis Island. They said, we're farmers. Where should we go? They said, North Dakota. <laughs> And to this day, you can go to that small little rural place in western North Dakota, and you will find a mosque. Second mosque in the United States, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. One of the, one of the earliest mosques in the United States, Keokuk, Iowa. Keokuk, Iowa. There was a little tiny Jewish community and a little tiny Muslim community. They both practiced a dietary tradition which required meat to be prepared in certain ways. They didn't have enough people to support a butcher. And so the rabbi and the imam got together and said, let's cut a deal here where we sort of trade back and forth, but we will, we will work together to make sure all of us can maintain our dietary traditions in this tiny town. Muslims and Jews in rural America working together, brothers and sisters, we're so glad to have Nada here, but we're also so glad for that opportunity to remember who we are. That's right. That we come from places that have solved all the problems of the world. <laughs> and that when we want to solve the next problem of the world, all we have to do is put our head to it. I'm so glad to be with you. I'm so glad to be here today. So glad to be here today with someone who, you know, there's always a delay. David Bowen, by the way, I want to mention David Bowen. State rep from Milwaukee, running for Democratic Party chair. Hey, if you keep yourself to a minute, brother, I'll let you say something. A minute? I'm not, I'm not going to be really that strict, but well, come and say a word. Minutes, my, yeah, yeah, come and say a word. David Bowen, ladies and gentlemen, David Bowen, David Bowen from Milwaukee, a small town on Lake Michigan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Nichols. And uh, thank you too for the two minutes. No, thank you. I'm going to keep fitting it up to two and a half, brother. Um, can we make more noise for that amazing speech, yeah. please? Yeah. Um, folks of the Grassroot Network, um, I am thankful to be here. I'm coming straight from the 4CD. Uh, they had their second their, uh, 4CD convention today. And uh, it was important that I spoke to the folks in that room um, because those folks will be uh, at our convention this June. Um, so I wanted to convey some messages that I only have 90 more seconds to say. <laughs> um, I'm honored that right now I am the first vice chair of the Democratic Party. I've been there for the last four years. And in 2015, we were not where we are right now, right? I would go to national meetings and, and, and convenings, and people would say, why is Scott Walker still a thing? <laughs> Have you guys not gotten tired of him yet? Um, and we said, OK, give us some time. We're the butt of your jokes now. Let us go to work first. We now have an operation that has beaten Scott Walker's. Make some noise. <laughs> That exists because we now have started usually earlier than we ever have before, uh, where we would, we would take months just to go into communities, have a quick conversation, and hey, vote for us, please, and then we would leave again. Uh, thankfully, that is not how we operated in 2018. We have turned things around where we have regional organizers that get on the ground much earlier, engaging our communities, and we now have a chance to go beyond the accomplishments of, 
2018. 1.7 million phone calls, 23,000 volunteer shifts, and over 250 neighborhood teams all across the state that ironically did 80% more doors than we did in 2016. Right. right? We're talking about a midterm operation when usually we would turn the lights off and we would go light, but we went heavy this time. And I think we can continue that. So the ticket that I'm running with, with the amazing Tammy Wood that I know that everybody in this room knows from Sauk County, uh, she is the chair there. And Alicia Lorta is a UW-Madison College student, 19 years old, running for second vice chair with me as well. Um, we have the most diverse ticket in party history. Um, I believe that this ticket has a fire running in us that you would not believe to be able to take us forward. And I truly think that if we make some things happen where we prioritize uh, small dollar donations just as big as our folks with bigger means, right? Um, so that we can not just be beholden to big donors, but also small donors as well, who can chip in $5 every week, every month, on a regular basis. We're talking about building real grassroots power and connections. I think it's important that we have a home, homegrown talent pipeline, where we don't have to parachute talent into our districts, into our counties, but actually lifting people up who have connections, who have the uh, the experience in our communities and actually giving them a shot to run our campaigns as well. Um, I, I feel like we have a lot of potential unleashing and tapping into the potential of our party and the time is right now. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time. David Bowen, man. He is running in a competitive race for chairman. He's running against a, a Really great guy named Really ben, great. Really great guy named Ben Wickham. And so you folks are going to have to really test this out. You're going to have to figure out which one, if you happen to be a Democrat. Now, David, i got to warn you, there are a few people in this room that might not even be Democrats. That's good, uh, too. That's all right. You guys are welcome in June. <laughs> good luck. But what I'm going to tell you is folks are going to have to sort that out because this is now suddenly being chairman of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin seems like it might be something. <laughs> it might be worth it. And that is because in this state, we have been in sort of a transformational moment. We have you know, been in the wilderness. There is no doubt of that. But we have been it. And you know, boy, that 40 days and 40 nights, that seems pretty short compared to eight years of Scott Walker, I'll tell you. So. Not to compare, there are complexities, I understand, but, but I know the people who've been there with us the whole route. And it's an awful lot of you folks. And I can't tell you the power, the strength of being able to say that we have an urban-rural coalition in this state. That's right. That we have African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans, 100-year farmers, century farmers, and newcomers, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, people of all religious traditions and non-believers that we have, we have folks who are of reasonable means and folks who are struggling to get by. And that we can pull that all together because there's a set of values that run deeper, deeper than everything they use to divide us. I cannot tell you the power, the strength that we have when I can go. I'm going to do a little MSNBC tomorrow morning, right? That thing, I, oh my gosh, I, I know they're going to say, oh, what about that Mueller report? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, the last night, man, they went, can you see that? I never saw people talk for six hours straight without having anything. Right? <laughs> you know, that's an amazing feat, man. And I don't have the talent to do it, but boy, if I did, <laughs> what I would say is, I love that Mueller report, but let me tell you about the grassroots network meeting I was at. <laughs> I got my faith in Robert Mueller. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, he's a cop. Um, but I got my faith in Robert Mueller. He may give us something. I believe that. I believe that. But I believe more strongly that what's going to beat Donald Trump in 2020, if he's still present, but what's going to beat Donald Trump in 2020 is going to be the renewal of rural 
and small town progressivism. That's going to tip these states back to the progressive guys. I believe that with my heart and soul. And I will tell you something. It's just not to pick on anybody, but in 2016, the crisis in Wisconsin, the crisis in Wisconsin was that our rural progressives, our rural progressive vote underperformed. It wasn't quite there. It wasn't. We have to acknowledge that. And you can say, well, it's because they just didn't like the cut of Tim Kaine's jib, right? Or whatever. I don't know. They like, but all I'll tell you is this. I promise you this. It wasn't because they liked Donald Trump. This is one of the great lies. Our media, which never ever comes to rural America, doesn't know anything about it, doesn't have any respect for it. Our media says, oh, man, you drive a mile out of town, it's all Trump country, right? Now that's the biggest lie imaginable. And I'll tell you, I know it, I know it, because I know Walworth County. Now you don't have to know it, because I do. <laughs> my sister lives down in Walworth. My, my brother-in-law farms, and there are still a few people with farms. My brother-in-law farms, you know, just outside of, outside of the Delavan area there. A uh, hundred cow dairy farm that his family's had for, since 1846. And so out there in Walworth County, in 2008 and 2012, Barack Obama, now I'm going to check with you, David Bowen, Barack Obama, right, an African-American, maybe some people would think, maybe not, you know, like somebody that you would associate with Walworth County, <laughs> if you've been there, and I know you have. Okay, so Barack Obama came close to carrying Walworth County. That's right. Did great out there. You know, he's getting like 40, I think he's getting like a high 40s. Second time around, a little bit lower, but still well into the 40s. Mm -hmm. In 2016, suddenly that total goes down to 30, like 32, 33% from mid 40s, right? And you're thinking, oh my gosh, all of my media friends, I tell you, they're, woof, because they're so smart, right? They all are like, oh, you see, all those people, all those rural folks, they just got up out of their Barack Obama voting habits, and they went over and they says, I got to vote for, I got to find me a racist to vote for. <laughs> I need a racist to vote for. And they find themselves some Donald Trump. Well, in fact, I know this is a really, it's too much to ask. I realize it's way too much to ask. But I actually went and looked at the numbers. Oh. No. Oh. And you know what? It's the interesting yes. thing about Walworth County. It is true. The Democratic vote out there collapsed. It was a nightmare. It really went down for, if you're a Democrat, man, that was a bad scene. But here's the interesting thing in Walworth County. Donald Trump got 200 votes less than Mitt Romney got in 2012. He got less votes than the Republican baseline from the previous election. So it wasn't that all those people out there in Walworth County or Vernon County or even, dare we say it, and I know Sock and, you know, counties around here kind of held their own, but it wasn't that these people all like upped and said, oh, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. It was that a heck of a lot of them said, I'm not going to vote. That's the truth. Native That's people too. Native people too. Oh, no no doubt about it. We had, uh, we had declines. We had all these declines in rural America. And so suddenly we've got this lie. And it's a cruel lie. We have a lie about rural America that's a foot in our land. It infects our politics. It causes people to say, oh, you know what? Maybe we just ought to worry about like winning elections in our cities, right? Or maybe we'll go for those, the mythical suburban women, right? <laughs> That's right, I'll, I'll get them, swing them over, do something. Like, and they say, well, you know, it's going, you can't, nothing out there in rural America. I'll tell you, if the Democratic Party falls for that lie, the Democratic Party will lose. It will lose. It will lose because the tipping point is always these rural counties. It's always that set of counties out along the Mississippi River. It's always those counties up, you know, to the, you go up into the northeastern part of the state. There's a set of counties in this state that will tip this state one way or the other. 
And the interesting thing about these kinds of people say, yeah, you know, it's a, those are all those white folks out there. Do you know who lives in rural America? The, boom, the number one boom group in rural America is Hispanics, Latinos. They are, Latinos are moving into our small towns, and you know what else they're doing? They're keeping our dairy farms functioning. Yes. We beat some of the ugliest anti-immigrant laws in the country when Latinos took a day off and came yes. down to Milwaukee and the dairy farmers called in to those Republican legislators and said, would you please not beat up on these people because they are the ones that are doing our work out here. And so that's who's living out there. You know, if you go around this country, Elizabeth Warren was just down in Mississippi. And she's talking to all these folks and she says, got to get rid of the Electoral College. And there was this huge round of applause. And you're thinking, why are people in Mississippi applauding get rid of the Electoral College? I thought they were a small state. I thought small states liked the Electoral College. If you look at that audience, there's a substantial number of African-American women in that audience. Do you know who makes up all sorts of rural counties in Mississippi? Where you go right up that Mississippi River, right? County after county after county, majority African-American rural counties. And you go out into, you go out into North Dakota and South Dakota, you got into some of our western states, you're going to find whole counties, whole counties that are overwhelmingly native counties. We have a native county in Wisconsin. I was on television on the night of the 2016 primary, and somebody's going, you'll appreciate this. They said, well, you know, Bernie Sanders, he doesn't do very well with minorities. That's what they said. And you know that David, of course, was a Bernie Sanders backer in 2016. But, you know that line, they said, oh, Bernie Sanders didn't do so well. And I said, you know, that's funny. That's kind of funny because um, Bernie Sanders just won the only majority minority county in the state. And everybody looked like, at me like I was crazy. Like, you know, just like, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, yeah, we have a county in the state of Wisconsin that is majority Native American, and they just gave the guy 63% of the vote or something like that. Better than Madison. Gave Better than Madison. Better. There you go. Yeah. And so when we start to unlock, but when we start to unlock the reality of rural America, what we find out is rural America isn't the cliche that the media tells us it is. Rural America is where the first mosque was built. Rural America is where we have county after county running up that Mississippi River with African Americans. Rural America is where we have huge Native American population. Rural America is where the boom population, the rising population is Latinos and Asian Americans. Rural America is a place where progressives can and must be organizing every single day, every night, because rural America can add its votes to that great wave that will sweep Donald Trump out of office. That's right. Compromise any value for rural America. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to go soft on the social issues. Do you think there are women in rural America that don't want health care? <laughs> really? Do you think there's people in rural America that don't want single-payer Medicare for all health care, everybody in, nobody out, universal health care? They, they, they want it, man. They want it. And do you think there's people in rural America who don't like a healthy, strong government? Well, let me tell you something. There's a heck of a lot of people in rural America that are going out. They know that way to that mailbox because that's where the Medicare or Medicaid check may come. That's where it's, you know, Jim Goodman, there's even some farmers that might get an occasional check from the government. <laughs> hey, gentlemen, Jim Goodman, the head of the National Family Farm Coalition. <laughs> America, I'm sorry, I don't want to keep talking about rural America, but I'm going to. <laughs> rural America, rural America, man, rural America is where we generate up the activists who make us not feel disconnected from one another. You know, I was down there at the uh, protest back in 2011. We had all, some of you may recall that. <laughs> I like to think my friend Scott Walker remembers. And when we had 
First, that first day, 8,000 people showed up. The first day, 8,000 people. Second day, 20,000. First weekend, 50,000. Second weekend, 100,000. That final weekend, right, when the state senators came back, when Jesse Jackson was there, 180,000 people. You could not look in any direction without seeing this sea of humanity. And what made that day so special? What made that day so special? I'll tell you, there were so many things. There were people in solidarity coming from all sorts of places. But I have to tell you, when those tractors rolled onto the square, those joined the workers, suddenly, you could not say, you couldn't tell the lie, Scott Walker. We're not going to do that till we're done. We're going to wait till we're finished with the phone. Now, we'll sort it out later. But we'll do it. But you could not tell the lie, Scott Walker. You could not claim, you could not claim that, that, that this was just people from Madison. Because you know what? I've been living it. My people came to Madison in 1838. They didn't even have a tractor then. <laughs> Madison's not a tractor town. It's an SUV town. And so the fact of the matter is when those folks on those tractors showed up, suddenly it broke the whole lie of trying to divide us. And you know who was on the first tractor? I was down there with my daughter because I cannot resist a tractor. I had this friend who came in from Cobb, right? And, you know, it's like, it was a, we had a tough struggle. There's a lot of things, and you could have told people, and maybe it, it wasn't worth the effort. But I had a friend who came in from Cobb, and he said, I'm talking to him, I saw him out there. My mom's from out there. And I said, hey, man, how you doing? You came in, I can't believe you're here. This is a pretty long distance. And he says, tell me about it. <laughs> I had to get up at midnight to do my milking so I could be done by 3 a.m. to drive the tractor in from Cobb. <laughs> in 20 degree weather. Oh. In snow. Yeah. Uphill. Because <laughs> <laughs> no one ever, no one in rural America has ever gone downhill. It's, 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 it's all, every hill is up. Um, and so, but, but they, they got there. And I just want to tell you, I went down there with my daughter to ride in with the tractors and do our thing. You know, because I thought that would be cool, and it was. Um, tractors don't move fast, so it was a nice <laughs> front hour and a half spent coming from, you know, just south of Madison in. But at the front of that tractor cake, having taken off another weekend after having taken off weekend after weekend after weekend to come and stand in solidarity as he has over many, many years, and doing so not just in solidarity with workers, but with civil rights struggles, with social justice struggles, with women's struggles, has been one of the great farm leaders of the state of Wisconsin, my friend Joel Greeno, who's in yeah. the back row. Glad the crack is in the back row on that day. Joel Greeno. That is a heroic, excellent American, brothers and sisters. And he is. He is still working the farm, working a second job, because in this country, we don't make it easy for farmers. Farmers struggle in this country. Is that right, Chris Marion? Yes, that is right. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Marion, who should be in the state senate, but will soon be in the state legislature somewhere. In the Let me tell you this, though. Let me tell you this. When Joel came down there, when Joel came down there, he came as one man, he came on his own. I remember seeing him standing down there one Saturday afternoon, just a friend, a comrade. And yet, when he came down there, he did not come as an individual. When a rural Wisconsinite shows up for a struggle, when a rural Wisconsinite joins a struggle that a bunch of city folks are in, right? that rural Wisconsinite breaks all kinds of cliches, breaks all kinds of stereotypes. When you show up as rural progressives, when you come, you make it different and better. And it's able to say, we've got a coalition that's bigger and stronger. And we start to really be able to reach out to all those other people. People in cities feel more confident when somebody from a rural town shows up and stands in solidarity with them. And people in rural towns feel more confident when somebody from a city comes and stands in solidarity with them. white nationalism stuff is all about. You know, you understand? That's why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. That's why they're doing it. Because they're terrified. They're terrified that we might 
Stop trying to look at how we're different and start trying to look at how we are the same. And the fact of the matter is, when Joel Greeno is having to take a second job to keep working on his farm, he is the same as some dad in the north side of Milwaukee who's got to take a second job to support his kids. When Chris Marion's got to run a bed and breakfast and a bake shop and a farm and like 10 other businesses just to make a decent living out there and still is actually the richest person I ever met. Um, when someone's got to do that, right? Out in, out in rural Lafayette County, am I right? Lafayette County, right? She is no different than the mom in Madison or Green Bay or someplace else who got her hours cut back in some office and is having to work that night at a Wendy's window or someplace to get enough money to get her kids where they need to be, working two, three jobs. And when we start to recognize those connections, when we start to realize that it's all one thing, that's when we start to win. Not a little, but we start to win big. And brothers and sisters, 2020 is not about winning by a little. If some candidate for president comes to you and says, you know, I think I can just beat Donald Trump. I want you to run screaming from the room. Because <laughs> you don't want to just beat Donald Trump by a little bit in 2020. You want a great, big, epic wave of votes. I want that wave to start. I want that wave to start out someplace between Darlington and you know, maybe up toward Argyle. And I want it coming right in there across central Wisconsin and heading toward Milwaukee, sweeping up across this state. Why, I want that wave to be so big, David Bowen, that when you come back to the legislature in 2021, right, there aren't gonna be any seats left for the Republicans because there are gonna be so many Democrats. <laughs> couple of independent greens and, and lefties to sit with you and keep you honest there. That's fine too. But I want to I want to make it into something rich and vibrant. I want it to be like that wonderful year 1964. Mm. Now if you're old enough you can remember 1964 in the state of Wisconsin. You know, I had this acquaintance up there in Fond du Lac. His name was John Race. He was a he lived just outside of Fond du Lac. He was a rural county board member on the Fond du Lac County Board. He worked as a machinist in a factory up there. And in early 1964, he's a good Democrat up there, and they said, John, John, we need a candidate for Congress up here. Nobody wants to run. Linus Van Pelt, or whatever his name was, some guy named Van Pelt was the congressman up there. He, had just, he, was, he was such a, he had represented an area like Joe McCarthy came from up in that area too. And Mr. Van Pelt was the one Wisconsin who voted against the Civil Rights Act. Right in there, voting. This is a bad scene, man. Awful stuff. And, and, and John Ray said, I don't know if I can run for Congress. You know, because I'm just a county board member. I'm a machinist. I'm not some big educated guy. I've got all this stuff. And he said, John, you're fine. You're, you've got the main qualification we need, which is you have a name we can put on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> John was like, oh! I guess I can do that. I don't have to, I don't have to give up uh, like any shifts at work, do I? And he said, John, as long as you give us your name, you're, you're good. <laughs> so John put his name on the ballot, and the Republicans then went and nominated Barry Goldwater for President of the United States. And then, obviously now you're too young to remember this, but Barry Goldwater didn't turn out to be all that great a candidate. Um, in fact, he pretty much lost everything except like about five states in the South that were still clinging to some past. And so in Wisconsin, the weird thing about it was, on that election night, Linda Johnson swept the state of Wisconsin. And Bill Proxmire swept the state of Wisconsin. And Bronson LaFollette, he got himself elected attorney general. Like Democrats were winning all over the place. Frank Nicolay. Oh, man, I wish everybody would applaud when they heard the name Frank Nicolay. <laughs> Greatest progressive ever to serve in the legislature from Abbotsford, Wisconsin. Woo! Rural progressive. Frank Nicolay came sweeping in, sweeping his majority of the legislature. But there are all, this, all these results coming in. John Race is down at the bar. 
right, with all the folks, right? And they're cheering Republicans losing, and they're cheering Democrats winning. And John Race is going, I gotta get going, I got an early shift at the factory. And he's walking out, and somebody says, John, take a look at the TV. You just got elected to Congress. <laughs> John Race had to take a leave from the machine shop to go to the Congress of the United States. He was the only member of Congress to list his occupation as factory worker. Wow. <laughs> and he went out to the Congress of the United States of America and he voted for the Voting Rights Act and he voted for Medicare and Medicaid and starting the war on poverty. Yes. Wow. Not bad. He got beat. He got beat in 66, as you might expect, because it was a very Republican district. They had gerrymandering back then. But understand this. I knew John late in life. Can you imagine that? One year, you just decided, Chris Mary, you just decided to run for office, right? One year, you just decided to run for office out in a place where there, Democrats are never supposed to have a chance, where your side is never supposed to win. And you're a, not just a Democrat. You're a progressive, and you run for this office. And you get to go and vote for voting rights and Medicare and Medicaid and a war on poverty. Right? I mean, I'll say, I'll take that two years. <laughs> I'll take that two years. And I'm hoping that 2020 is that kind of election. The 2020 is only going to be that kind of election if people start to think about that kind of coalition. All races, all religions, big and small, rural and urban, together with some sort of core message. And I'll leave you with a notion. My friend, and I love to be able to say this. This is a, a treasure being able to say this because he was a friend. He wrote introductions to my books. And, and we knew each other before a lot of stuff. My friend, Paul Wellstone. Yeah. Paul Wellstone. <laughs> Paul Wellstone was one of you folks. He wasn't, he wasn't one of them. He was one of you. Paul Wellstone was a professor, so maybe he wasn't one of us, but you know, he's, he's still a pretty, pretty down-home guy, and he's teaching at university and stuff like that, but his great passion was going out. He got all wrapped up in the farm crisis in the mid-1980s. There was this horrible farm crisis in the mid-1980s. It was devastating, and, and our government was, was just letting farmers down left, and you know, Steve, right? Those were hard times, and government was just making terrible policies, and it wasn't working for farmers. Farmers were being forced off the land. There were tractor caves. There was all kinds of protests. It was a really difficult moment. Paul Wellstone got all wrapped up in that as a Jewish guy from Washington, D.C., who had come out to Minnesota. And in the midst of that struggle, this brings us around to some of the beautiful words that Nada gave us at the beginning. In the midst of that struggle back there, that's okay. Somebody calling in there. That's all right. Don't you worry. They're calling in in solidarity with us because they know what we're talking about. People wish they were in this room, being part of what we're doing. <laughs> and so Wellstone, they, there are more coming. They're coming left and right. We love them for that. We love you for that. So Paul Wellstone, is, he gets all wrapped up in this, but not a, it, this is before you're born. It's amazing, right? This is back in the 1980s. And the white nationalists, right, the racists, because that's what they are. White nationalism is a what that word mean? What does that mean, right? Oh, we ought to denounce white nationalism. No, we ought to denounce racism, right? That's the thing that we have to understand. White nationalism, white supremacy, that's racism. It's understood as such. So the racists thought the farmers are really mad. And they thought, well, we're going to go exploit the rural folks, right? We get out to there as rural towns because the farmers say, yeah, it's majority white out there. We'll go out there and we'll tell them that the Jewish bankers are doing something. Or that your money's going to the welfare mother. They had all those lines that were trying to drive those divisions, drive divisions between people. And Paul Wellstone, he decided he's going to go organize. He's going to try to organize across all these lines of division. Yet there's all these stories about the racial division. There's all these stories about, about white supremacists and about white nationalists and about racists work in the rural towns. And Paul Wellstone's wonderful wife, Sheila, Sheila Wellstone says one night when he's going out to some rural town to do some organizing and try and get people together, 
Sheila says, you know, Paul, I'm not sure you should go tonight. I was reading in the paper, somebody had shot a banker, right? And they saw it was, I think guns were coming into this thing. It was getting violent out there, and it was anti-Semitic. It would have been Islamophobic, but they didn't even, they hadn't even gotten to that level yet. But it was anti-Semitic, it was racist. They were doing all, you know, all the stuff we think about out there. And Sheila said, I don't want you to go, Paul. He said, I promised these people in this little town I'm going to go. I've got to be there. And she said, Paul, Paul, they know you're Jewish. If somebody, you're going to be a target out there. I, I, I'm really concerned. So Paul went out to, he just said, I've got to do it. So he goes out to this small town, and he's in a, in a little tavern in a town of a couple hundred people. And he's standing on a, on a pool table giving a speech about how farmers and working people in the cities and packing house workers in small towns, all these people got to get together in some great coalition and fight against the economic powers that are holding everybody down to fight for economic and social and racial justice. He's given this speech on that table and there's a bunch of farmers and they're applauding and they're signing up. A lot of those farmers helped to elect him to the United States Senate, not once but twice, beating a Republican senator in Minnesota at a time when that wasn't an easy thing to do. Same time Feingold was coming up here. And so it was a worthwhile meeting. But you know, if you knew Paul, he could never leave early. He's like me or like Garvey or one of these people. It's like there's one last person to talk to, you gotta talk to him. Right? <laughs> Watch out on that, Chris. It never it's, it never turns out well. But the fact of the matter is that he always stuck around to talk to the last person. And so Paul was standing there that talking to the last person. He finally he goes out in the parking lot. It's about eleven thirty at night. And the lights is rural Minnesota in the winter, and the lights are out, and you know, there's like it was like you know, snow blowing across the fields, and it was cold and dark, kind of like a Truman Capote. <laughs> and he goes out that door, he walks out that door, and he's coming across the parking lot, trudging across that snow, going to his car. And you know, it's truthful, his wife had warned him, he's feeling a little bit, you know, just a little, kind of keeping an eye over his shoulder there. And he sees somebody in the shadows, and a guy, guy, kind of steps forward. And this isn't just a guy. This is like, this guy, six foot four, right? Blonde, airy looking, you know, that blonde hair swept back. Young guy, wearing one of those, one of five, Joel knows, he has like a farm jacket there, you know, the look. and he comes over and he goes, you Wellstone? <laughs> <laughs> and Paul, who had been a wrestler in high school, it's about 5'4". <laughs> Paul's like getting his wrestling thing on. He goes, yeah. <laughs> yes. And that goes, Wellstone. That's a Jewish name, isn't it? <laughs> Paul looks at him and he goes, he's got his little star David. He looks up and he goes, yeah. But what does that matter? This big, tall, blonde guy looks down at him, pauses for a second, like he's crazy. Looks at Paul Wellstone like he's just crazy. And he says, doesn't matter at all. <laughs> I'm Finnish. We minorities got to stick together. <laughs> Take one with you and then we'll share them. All right, you go in here. Come on, come on. 